Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast slash internet radio look at all things Beatles, their history, what's happening now, and possibly what may be happening in the future. Uh, my name is Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. Uh, first of all, the uh, the host of the uh, syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hey, Al. How's everyone doing? And all the way out in uh, on the West Coast, we have the uh, the the Beatles examiner and examiner for uh, various other uh, of subject matter on examiner dot com, and uh, certainly he gets every every scoop that's out there as far as uh, that's in the uh, in the Beatle world, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, our resident musicologist, longtime contributor for Beatle Fan Magazine, uh, and a uh, longtime classical music critic for uh, the New York Times and also various other publications, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. First, we have a few things to to take care of, Um, uh, uh, one is which is a little bit of housekeeping. Back a couple of weeks ago, when we talked about Pet Sounds and uh, Bob Dylan's um, uh, Blonde on Blonde, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, that Robert Rodriguez had come up with the information uh, that since there had been a great deal of publicity about the fact that Pet Sounds and Blonde on Blonde officially had been released on the same day in May of 1966, turns out that it actually that Blonde on Blonde was actually released at least the stores uh, sometime late in June of 66 and I had credited that uh, the information to our friend uh, Robert Rodriguez through his uh, uh, Fab 4 FAQ 2.0 page on Facebook uh, as it turns out the uh, that information had gotten to Robert through actually a friend of this show and that is Michael Lynch, the fellow who who uh, uh, composed and performed the the theme for this show that you hear uh, that you hear each week, and uh, and it's uh, and it, which is very interesting when you consider that Michael is actually a hardcore Rolling Stones fan. And when uh, we first um, got to know each other on Facebook. A few years back, uh, we had a few spirited Beatles Stones debates, <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, Michael's uh, Michael's a good guy, and uh, so we wanted to you know give him uh, give him full credit for uh, for that piece of information. So so yes, um, Blonde on Blonde did reach stores late in June of 1966, not in the middle of uh, not in the middle of May. So there. And actually, um, actually, mm-hmm. Michael's been a guest on our show twice. Yeah, we had a spirited Stones Beatles debate with him too. Here, <laughs> yes, yeah, you may true. recall. That's and true. before before Al and Alan joined the show, when it was just Steve and me, we had a discussion about uh, the Dave Clark Five and uh, the new documentary that had just came out at the time that was getting a lot of attention and was actually broadcast on PBS stations. Yes. So we used him as uh, for his take on the whole. Dave Clark Five phenomena. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Well, speaking of a take, uh, as we're taping this, Ken last night saw Ringo Starr and, and his All Star Band in concert uh, in uh, in New York, and uh, you can give us maybe a capsule review. And you've also got some thoughts about you've uh, received in the mail your copies of uh, Pure McCartney and uh, and I believe the Traveling Traveling Wilburys reissue as well. Right. Well, the Ringo concert was was great as all of his All Star bands have been, and uh, as we all know. He's been using the same band now since 2012, and you can tell that they're all very comfortable working with each other, and they're just phenomenal musicians. I mean, the highlights for me, as I've been saying the last few years, are when they do some songs where they're really jamming, and uh, that usually takes place on the Santana songs that Greg Raleigh sings, and the Toto songs that Steve Lukather sings. And uh, the musicianship is phenomenal, and the camaraderie and the fun aspect of it all 
uh, is something that you see in every single one of the concerts. Part of the fun in, in watching uh, the All-Stars is to see the interaction between the musicians and what they say about each other and clown around with each other. Seeing Todd, Todd Rungman especially, running around the stage, posing with various members, going back behind the drum kit while, while Ringo's drumming. You know, there's a lot of fun. There's a very big fun aspect in seeing the show. Um, it's pretty much the exact same uh, track listing of all the songs, with the exception of the fact that he brought back What Goes On huh. as the third mm-hmm. song in the set list, which worked really well when he did that in the past. Um, it's just, if, for whatever reason, it's a song that works great as a live song. Mm-hmm. And uh, he joked around and said this is the only Lennon-McCartney-Starkey song, but it really should have been credited as starkey mccartney lennon <laughs> you know and uh it was just uh you know it's a great it's a great con concert any all-star band has been great and um i'm never going to go as far as to say this is the best one although it just seems like ringo really loves this lineup but i think a lot of that has mm. to do with not only are they great musicians but they get along great as friends they're really close and uh this is a band that at this point can just do these songs in their sleep. They're just that good. And mm-hmm. so uh, this was a packed audience. I saw them at the Paramount, the legendary Paramount, um, mm-hmm. in uh, Port Chester, New York. And it was a phenomenal show. Um, since he, he brought back What Goes On, my one uh, disappointment was that he took out Island in the Sun from Postcards from Paradise. That was the only song that he had done that was new the last time around. So there was nothing from his most recent album. The band just sounded really killer, as they always do. Um, In particular, I loved uh, Year 16 sounded phenomenal. Really much more up-tempo than in uh, uh, previous bands, I think, anyway. But, um, yeah, the crowd really loved it. And um, spectacular show, you know. You have any questions for me? And, and, (laughs) And, of course, he still hasn't done Only You. Yeah, well, there's so many songs he hasn't done, especially from his solo career. And like we were saying in our last show, the only song from the Beatle catalog, from Please Please Me Through Let It Be, that he sang lead to that he's never done live, is Good Night. And um, yeah, I just think that he, he prefers to not do the slow songs mm. for whatever the reason. You know, maybe he thinks it'll put the audience to sleep. I don't know what it is. But uh, for the most part, when you when you listen to this concert, every song is an up tempo song. So, um, and for me, the thrill is also seeing the audience reaction to to this show. And so many people, whether you're talking about Ringo or Paul, are seeing them for the first time. So, anybody who leaves this show, they're either regulars who know what to expect, mm-hmm. or they're first time goers, Atten- attendees, yeah. <laughs> attendees, yes. And they love the show, and they're blown away by it. And, um, you know, this is the, the thing about the All-Star Band is, is that it's, it's a great idea for bringing together fans of all these different artists. You know, mm-hmm. I would guess that most people are going to the show to see Ringo, but you've always got the Todd fans, and you've got Santana fans who want to see Greg Raleigh, and, and they all work together so well. And then, hopefully, they grow to appreciate the other artists' music at the same time. So um, you get fans from all the different members of the All-Stars. And also at the same time, a lot of these artists would not be able, I believe, to sell venues this big. Although the Paramount mm-hmm. is only 2,000 seats. But mm-hmm. I doubt very much that Richard Page and Mr. Mister can pack an audience like that. I know Todd can. But, um, and then, of course, Santana can or, or Toto can as a band. I don't know how much them individually can. They usually play small clubs, but you put them all together with Ringo and they can sell out. So it turns out to be, you know, a success all around for every single musician, which is part of the beauty of this whole thing. Mm. Um, You know, obviously, and I could say this about Paul, I wish that Ringo would go deeper into the catalog, even bring him back songs that he hasn't done for a long time. You know, like Weight of the World, which he only did really on, uh, say, the second tour. From 1992, mm-hmm. you know, things like that, or certain songs that work really well live. But um, yeah, it, it was a great show. I saw a lot of new shirts for sale. And as I <laughs> have been saying many times, no CDs. 
You can't buy, you know, whether it's his greatest hits, the uh, photograph collection or postcards in paradise. No CDs there, but it's all clothes, you yeah. know, and bracelets mm-hmm. and hoodies and all that. And the program booklet, too. And that's it. But, you know, if you've never seen Ringo live, you owe it to yourself to see them because it is a great concept. And, you know, it definitely is a crowd pleaser right there on every level. What I think is really, really, I guess you could almost call it miraculous, is that after all these years, it's still the whole all-star band concept is going as strong as it is. Because if you think about it, it's basically the same thing that was being used by, oh, let me think of some names, um, Grassroots, by, you know, I mean, by a lot of other bands where they would use one person and use backup players. Mm. Now in, in the All Star Band in the All Star Band granted there are he, he used more name players. Okay. But I mean basically that's where it started because I'm trying to think of the guy's name that promoted the, the first couple of tours there. David you, Fishoff. I mean, David Fishoff, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a, it's basically an offshoot of what Fishoff was doing. And the fact that Ringo's kept it going and it and it's you know, and it's thrived as much as it has is really kind of amazing. Oh, you know? it's 20, 20, 27 years now. It's mm-hmm. uh, I guess no, nobody else really could have done that. Uh, like, um, well, uh, I, I mean, Paul could have, but Paul wouldn't do that. But I mean, no, but I mean, you know, I mean, it, it it really worked a lot better than he's really he's really made it work really well. And you have to, I mean, for that, it's a it's a great credit to Ringo for that. Mm-hmm. But the big I mean, difference here is that mm-hmm. you've got the same musicians on stage all playing with each other together as a band. Mm-hmm. You've got a lot of package shows that have been successful. You'll have 70s right. acts packaged together and 80s acts and all that so that you can sell bigger venues. Uh, but here, instead of having separate acts doing their own show, you've got one band mm-hmm. together doing their own songs. And, and that's part of the fun, too, is to hear... Ringo drum to a Toto song, you know, or Todd Rundgren play to a Santana song. This is the only kind of atmosphere, the only kind of way that that can even happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget when when he had Gary Brooker on the tour, and the night I saw him with Gary Brooker, he introduced "Whiter Shade of Pale" as one of the greatest songs ever, and mm-hmm. he, I think he even said he was he was thrilled to play on it, and that was that was really something. And then seeing him. You know, play with uh, Ian Hunter and, and, you know, I mean, the breadth of uh, the, the variety of people he's had, you know, on the on this tour, uh, on the on the tour through the years. It's just a, it's absolutely wonderful. You know, mm. yeah, I'm sure there are there are a lot of people who would, you know, rather see him work with another, you know, with a variety of other artists, particularly more people that are more contemporary of of Ringo's people from the 60s mm. and 70s but he seems just very comfortable with this group so much so that how long has this been now about 3 years that he's four, four years wow that he's yeah. that he's toured with this this lineup and he's just very comfortable with them so you know more power to him well you know mm-hmm. to what you just said Al my favorite lineup still to this day is the one that had um, Howard Jones mm-hmm. and Greg Lake and Roger mm-hmm. Hodgson and Sheila E. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you're dealing with Roger Hodgson, you're talking about mid 70s into the 80s when right. Super Tramp was, was at their height of popularity. But uh, Greg Lake, you can go from 60s and 70s too. But you've got mm-hmm. a lot of 80s in there. And they yes. all mesh together so well. And mm-hmm. that's part of the phenomena of this whole thing is that you can see a lot of artists that on paper don't seem to make much sense. <laughs> But they all gel somehow. Yeah. They get together in this band, you know? Yeah. And to go from in the court of the Crimson King <laughs> to uh, the glamorous life from Sheila E. in the same band, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's just, that's what I love the most about it is the variety, too. And all mm-hmm. the, the band members really love doing this. And it's the only, the only way when these musicians can get together and do this kind of thing. Well, very true. Oh, I love I, I love the uh, the uh, the one with Levon Helm and Billy Preston. I mean, oh, was, the fir- oh, the first one that was yeah. classic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was that was that was classic. And and to hear, I never did see the band, but to hear Levon Helm sing the night they drove old Dixie down, just it was, yeah. Oh God, that was just wonderful. That was yeah. that was absolutely wonderful. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there have been there have been a lot of good there have been a lot of good bands, and and the nice thing about seeing this one now is every time I think I've seen them twice now. Well, no, I've seen them all every time they've come through the area. They get tighter and tighter. You can hear it, you know, and they really. That's one thing that was not evident in the earlier bands is how comfortable these guys are with each other now, and that's the one thing they've gained from staying together like that. Mm-hmm. And I certainly don't mind if Ringo uses 80s artists in there or moving into the 90s even, if it fits. How about Kanye? <clears throat> I know that's what, that's what you're waiting for. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I think so. And Rihanna. You want him to do life with the lions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now, uh, along with seeing Ringo last night, Ken mentioned that he did get uh, his copy of Pure McCartney over the weekend, yeah. and since uh, we devoted a fair that's, amount of very spirited right. debate mm-hmm. to that album, uh, what are uh, now? You, I, I I think you said you just sampled it. You haven't uh, listened. No, to I've, I've listened. No, I have listened to the whole thing. Oh, you have. Okay, and yeah. Um. Well, I love it. <laughs> I love the selection. Although, as we have discussed, we would make changes to the selection, as mm-hmm. any fan would. But, um, you know, what I like most, as I said, is, is the bouncing around from all the different decades, from different albums. And I love it that way. But I did want to point out, because I'm sure some people want to know about specific mm. songs, what, which versions came out or mm-hmm. the edited versions. But I made a very quick list. And mm-hmm. first of all, I do want to say that everything here, it, they're all studio recordings. So the version of Maybe I'm Amazed is the one from the McCartney album. The version of Coming Up is the one from McCartney, too. It's the studio recording. It's not the live one that was the hit. Right. So, um, also, listen to what the man said. Actually has that spoken intro from Paul that was on Venus and Mars. Mm. You know, that, uh, all right, okay, that bit. Yeah. That was included in there. Um, The big shock for me was Uncle Albert Albert Halsey, because it doesn't end like it fades on the single. It ends the same way that it does on the album, Ram, where it's the lead guitar part that leads into Smile Away. So you do hear that guitar part, and it's not the way that you heard it as a hit record. So it's very strange. That was lifted right from the album. Um, Junior's Farm, thank God, is the full version. It's not the edited version. Uh, Say, Say, Say is the 2015 remix. Pipes of Peace. Pipes of Peace has the full intro as on the album, unlike the single, which started right with the piano going into Paul's vocals. And on the other hand, No More Lonely Night starts with Paul's vocal, like the single, mm. like the album. So, right. uh, like I said, coming up is the studio version. Now, my big disappointments. Venus and Mars Rock Show is the single edit, which I thought was horribly done. And it's mainly because I love the full version so much, and it all flows so well, the sure. way it was on the album. Mm-hmm. I never liked the single edit, but that's the one that's on here. And with little luck is also the single edit. It's a shame because yes. I, I love that instrumental bit Me too. In, in the middle and mm-hmm. how it all builds. I thought that was just, you know, that's a highlight for me when I listen to that. I don't yeah. want to listen to with little luck any other way yeah. than that way. Mm-hmm. So those were the ones in case people are wondering about that, of those songs. And um, like I said, I, I do like the selection on here. We can make a lot of changes. I'm sure we all would. Um, the deluxe version has a mixture of photos that you've seen before and some that you've never seen. There are no liner notes, really. I mean, there's just for each song, it tells you who the musicians are and what albums they're from. And you just have that quote that we have read from the press release about why Paul did this just for fun, something that you'd like to hear when you're traveling in your car. And that's all there really is to it. Hmm. But, um, you know, I do think, as I said before, that the way to go for anyone who's a new fan who wants to discover Paul's solo music is to go with a compilation that spans his entire career. It does fascinate me how he picked these songs. The very heavy emphasis on his more recent material. And um, I'm sure that, especially for the Wings fans, they probably want more. But, um, you know, and like, like we said before, a big shocker, nothing from Flowers in the Dirt on here. And uh, I'm sure we can all debate what we would want on a compilation like this. But um, I found it to be fun because I, I actually listened in the car. And even though I know what the songs are, I, I've known what the songs are on this compilation. I didn't memorize the track listing. So I'm listening to it with fresh ears, not knowing what the next song's going to be. 
And uh, I found it a very interesting mix. The only time when I actually had a diff had any difficulty with it is when it went from uh, I think it was was it too many people into new. Let me just tell, oh, let me roll it into new. Too many people, let me roll it into new. Where well, you're hearing early McCartney into something more recent, and you can tell the difference in his voice. Mm -hmm. So that's the only time when I had uh, any kind of difficulty there. But I love the song selection overall, and uh, I'm real glad that it came out. But as we debated when the, uh, the track listing was first announced, mm -hmm. why, if somebody has all of these recordings, including those single mixes, uh, including the t 2015 mix of Say, 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 if they right. have everything that's on here, why should they buy this? Well, as far as I'm concerned, this is not geared toward the hardcore fan. This is geared toward someone who wants to explore Paul's solo career that doesn't know it that well. This is either a new fan or a casual fan. And for all the people, the very same people that buy every single Beatle release, even though they have everything anyway, right. it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. There'll be Paul McCartney fans who will buy this to complete their collection. Sure. So, you know, it is nice to have a lot of this stuff all on one collection. It's nice to have certain songs you know, I, I just love the fact that he picked certain songs that I thought he never would. Like mm -hmm. I said before, Souvenir. It's a great R&B type song from Flaming Pie. I love the fact that it's on there. Arrow Through Me. The fact that he's recognizing that as a song that he likes. You know, that's a song that he has chosen not to do live. You know, except in the 79 tour. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Just to know that he went through his entire catalog and picked certain songs that must be favorites of his. You know, Warm and Beautiful, addressing a song like that. Early days. You know? Um, I think the, you know, the, the most... The one complaint that I would agree with is that it should be a bit more balanced between all the decades. But um, as I pointed out before, since the last time he did put out something was uh, Wingspan, and that only covered up to 1984... I do like the fact that he's addressing the 80s, 90s, and last decade, and this decade. Mm -hmm. So, Well, rather than uh, uh, replay the same debate again, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if can uh, I, either... Can I just make... Can I, can yeah, I just please. Make, well, yeah, I was going to say, if either you or Alan has uh, have a comment before we move on, by all means. Because I got a copy, too, although I haven't really spent a whole lot of time listening to it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean... I will say that li that listening to it and not uh, again, I didn't mem I didn't uh, also memorize the track listing, and it sounds a little I, I don't know how to say uh, better than I expected listening to it, but it's still not probably one of the most spectacular McCartney releases, and and I don't know if I even call it um, you know absolutely necessary, um, especially when. You know, like Ken said, you can make up the whole thing from everything that's out there, you know, so mm -hmm. it's it's too bad that, uh, but, you know, there are some nice pictures in the in the deluxe book. There are some very nice pictures, and uh, I, is it, there's, uh, I believe there's text in there, too, isn't there, Ken? Isn't there, it's, no, there's, it's, there's only information about each song, like who the writer uh, was, what album it's from, and who plays on it. Okay. Like I said, I, I haven't been able to a time with it yet, but... Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it the most necessary McCartney uh, release. But I mean, if you, obviously, if you, if you're a big Paul fan, you'll get it. So, but like I said, yeah. this is really geared more towards people who are not experts on Paul's solo career, and they're probably not oh, going to be nearly think, as I, judgmental. I disagree with that. Uh, I because I think I think the only people that are really going to care are people that care about Paul. I don't think anybody that that really doesn't I can't see a whole lot of people really going for it maybe well, I'm wrong you know, I, I just I, I, I totally disagree with you there's all different levels of fans out there and even in our last show when I was I should have bounced off of this when you were saying that you think that most people who go to McCartney shows know all the songs I don't agree with that you know how many people that went to Paul's concerts do you think owned a copy of new percentage wise I'll bet you a very small percentage. Probably. Oh, I think a lot more than you think. Uh, no, I, think I don't. Mm, no. 
enough people no. said that if if everybody who went to see Paul when he toured when that album came out, that album would have hit number one. Yeah. If they bought it. Right. You know, most people who go to see Paul McCartney in stadium shows or whatever know him for his Beatles stuff and a handful of his solo music. The mm. majority of people are not they're not us. They're not Rick Lover, you know. Those are the small, those are the minority of people. The majority of people who go to see Paul are just casual fans who know him for his Beatles and a handful of his solo hits. Band on the Run, Live and Let Die, Maybe I'm Amazed. Mm -hmm. They might know a bit more, and a lot of the young people who are coming up barely know a lot of his solo hits anyway. Yeah. So that's just reality, because radio barely plays it, or wherever they're getting their music from, they're not, they're not really exposed to it. So I, I, I totally think, disagree with what you said I, in the show the last time. I think the price, the price of the tickets keeps a lot of the casual fans away. So I, I, I really think that it's, it's those people that go. Yeah. But Well, the price, of, the price of tickets keeps people away from any almost any concert these days. Be, you know, any major act. You know, mm-hmm. the, the concert, the ticket prices are just so, so ridiculously high because oh, of, the cost, you know, the cost of these tours and all and, and renting stadiums and things like that. But, uh, you know, so, so obviously the, the, more, the more casual fan is, you know, is probably who may have already seen Paul may say, well, no, nah, I already saw him. I don't really have to see him again. You know, well, you know. anyway. and Mr. Mr. Cozen, as usual, is laying in the weeds and <laughs> see yes. if he had any thoughts. Well, no, I mean, you know, I haven't got my copy yet, and um, I've already spoken theoretically about it in a couple of shows. And um, so, I mean, what I am from what Ken is telling me, it, it sounds like. Um, pretty much a waste of time i mean i i bought all the <laughs> all the editions and so i am entitled to to feel that way i'm not asking for my money back um i i anticipate simply filing them on the shelf perhaps taking the four cd version and putting it in my uh itunes playlist and possibly never even playing it but possibly playing it who knows if if for some reason uh you know on the 10th anniversary we decide to have a show about about pure mccartney again i maybe i'll go through it but uh so nice to know it's nice to know what an influence i can be on on my co-host here on the show <laughs> well but, but ken i mean I, I am precisely the person you're saying that this isn't for um, so I think it was very nice of me to buy all the different editions of it, and and that's the most he can expect from me. Okay, well, <laughs> you can say that about a lot of the Beatles albums that you buy a million times over, that you have the same songs. Yes, over I could and over. I could say that, but those are brilliant from start to finish, and I would listen to any of them any time. You know, okay, I bought well, the mon- I bought the mono, I'm, I'm quite mono happy LP with set. I played it from start to finish. I bought the stereo LP set. Played it from start to finish. This stuff, you know, I don't know. There's great stuff on it. Absolutely great stuff on it. I personally would rather hear it in the context of the original albums or, you know, the singles or whatever, you know, I'm playing at the time. Hearing it jumbled together like this doesn't do much for me. But, you know, as you say, newcomers, etc., fine, you know, let them uh, let them enjoy it and discover other stuff. I, I, that's fine. <laughs> So, I'm so trying to be reasonable here, Ken. <laughs> if, you, if, if just out of curiosity here, if you heard a radio program like mine where I mix all the Beatles and solo stuff together, would that throw you off? That's would a radio you program. Just hear the albums. Well, it's a radio program. I expect that from a radio program. Well, I don't have to go buy. Like I don't have to go buy a radio program and and put it on my shelf or play it myself. It's radio. It's you know the mm-hmm. nature of it is that you don't know what's coming next, and you know it's it's a whole different thing. Right. Well, this is kind of like you have all these songs and you put them on shuffle and here they are. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's an element of surprise there. Yes, that's true. And I like putting things on shuffle. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm just strange. I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't know yes, what you to are. say. <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, what do you want By the me? way, I, I haven't <laughs> listened to the Traveling Wilburys yet. I will okay. listen this coming week. So maybe I'll talk about it in the next show. Okay. All righty. And I assume the same for you, Steve? Yes. Yeah, I will okay. too. Okay. 
All righty. On to the next subject, which unfortunately this seems to – it's becoming almost a weekly thing. Yeah. We lost another one, um, and this year we're losing – you know, we're not just losing minor figures in pop culture. We're now we're losing giants. We're losing David Bowie. We're losing Prince. We're losing Sir George Martin, albeit at ninety. And this Saturday morning, I woke up to the news that Muhammad Ali had passed away. And uh, and as a matter of fact, by the time I got up, had breakfast, and got onto the computer, what was waiting for me was a uh, Beatles Examiner post from from Steve Marinucci that he must have posted at about five in the morning, out uh, you know where I am, uh, with uh, the you know what what we know as the you know the the Beatles uh, the, the Beatles Cassius Clay connection and. Steve, why don't you uh, – uh, rather than get into a, a really tasteless plug for my own book, why don't you explain it, Steve? <laughs> well, uh, I, I, you mean uh, talk about the uh, about the, the Beatles and Cassius Clay? Or yes. Talk about, yeah. um, yes. Um, yes. I mean there – you know, the so many people have, have, um, have written about it. I was astonished. In the, I think mine was one of the first, but I mean, it was. I yeah. saw several. I saw several after that mm-hmm. that uh, basically went through, uh, you know, went through the facts of, of that. But uh, you know, um, the Beatles were were. I mean, it was basically a photo op for both, and they both made use of it, and they they you know they had a, a great time, and it's become one of the most you know iconic moments in you know. One of these things where you've seen pictures uh, over and over, and there are pictures uh, floating on eBay all the time. That I know, you know, I, even that day, you know, people selling prints from it, and autograph photos and things, and you know, it was such a cool moment. And, and uh, it apparently, and I didn't realize this at the time, was not the last contact between you know Muhammad Ali and a member of the Beatles because right. there's pictures of like John and Yoko and, right. and mm-hmm. um, yep that uh, Jimmy like Carter 75 or so yeah, uh, yeah. 77 at Jimmy, Jimmy Carter's inaugural all right oh. okay. right i was wondering right. where that came from yeah yeah so hmm. but uh you know i mean that was just very cool that uh and and the man just you know i mean for all the for you know i remember when he first came up uh you know how brash he was, and and you know he was very, uh, very much a showman. You know as far as you know um, being out there in the news, and of course it was his conscientious objector stand that really mm. you know made the big mark. That really uh, you know pulled him apart from the crowd, and it, it's so cool now. And that's all people have been talking about since and, mm. uh, and since his passing, and and. Uh, an amazing man, it really was. And I, I saw, was it over the weekend that he used to, he used to sign for free. I mean, he used to pay, get, do paid signings, but he also used to sign for free if he sure. wanted him. Uh, and there are, uh, and I won't mention any particular names, but there are people that will not. And uh, and you know, and he didn't. I, I believe he did not speak at the end of. He lost his voice at the end of his life, and you know, so it was uh, an amazing man, a really amazing man. One so. could say that uh, that those photos that were taken at at the uh, uh, at his training camp uh, there in February of '64 that you've got in that picture arguably the five most important pop culture figures of their time. Mm-hmm. You know? And and they were and they were they were on their way at that point. They were both on their way because he oh, yeah. had not this he was... had not won. The- it was right. before he defeated Sonny Liston, and right. it was just after the Ed Sullivan show when the, right. when the Beatles were mm. really taken off. Ex- when they exactly. were, they still had gone. They still hadn't gone the entire way. They had yeah. still, you know, Beatlemania, Beatlemania was still happening, and it, and so it was an incredible moment in time for both of them. And uh, yeah. you know, Very the fact true. that they they came together and united uh, at that point was uh, an amazing, you know, amazing. Um, not to be totally self-serving, but yeah, in um, in changing times, 101 days that shaped the generation. Uh, in the the chapter on sports, I 
devote a fair amount of space to the the Clay Liston fight and the, and especially the prelude to it, which included uh, the Beatles uh, the the Beatles visit, which uh, you know was you know was really a kind of like a, a a media a media created event, you know and. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was very spontaneous. Uh, the Beatles themselves, you know, they, you could tell they're, they're not sure how much they're enjoying this. Uh, John Lennon particularly supposedly didn't really enjoy it all that much. And, uh, and in fact, Brian Epstein was uh, apparently not in favor of them doing this at all. But uh, but the you know the 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 needs of uh, of the press of that time kind of uh, kind of won out, and so they had this uh, this photo op, and uh, you know little it, it, it's funny because some of the stories that have come out have talked about how uh, that uh, the Beatles were actually big Liston fans, and that mm. wasn't that wasn't the case. It was just that at that point the. Sonny Liston was such a heavy favorite that that reporters were being told, you know, not just to go to the fight, but then to go to a particular hospital after the fight to see if if Clay was going to be, you know, delivered to that hospital because he had taken such a severe beating by Liston. And of course, that, you know, (laughs) quite the opposite happened uh on on february 25th 1964 and uh which uh which you know makes uh and of course the fact that as steve said uh the fact that he right from the very get-go right after winning the championship he uh adopted the the nation of islam uh within weeks had become muhammad ali uh and on from there so he really from almost from the beginning kind of almost transcended being just a boxer you know much oh, in yeah. the way much in the way that the beatles uh, kind of transcended just being musicians exactly and he and he was also and he was also one of the most controversial figures in oh. the 60s oh absolutely um, for you know for several reasons um, i mean his conscientious objector thing his his religious thing i mean that that well really... well Allen's old newspaper the new york times for several years after he had changed his name to muhammad ali continued to call him cassius clay in the uh in april of uh, 67 when ali refused to Take the step. By the way, Alan was not in, not on the New York Times at that point, so right. I'm not. Right. I'm not saying like that he's. That, that, I'm not saying that he's responsible for this. Yeah. Right, you were the it's, age. Of, you, you were the age of the editors that are there now, right? Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but in April of '67, uh, in fact, you can see it on Time Machine, which is you know the digital um, uh, archive of, of the Times material. Uh, the uh, the article that um, on Ali not taking the step refers to him as Cassius Clay, hmm. and that's it, you know it, th- three years after he won the heavyweight championship and after he had changed his name uh, that didn't happen for instance with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar when he changed his name when he changed his name from Lou Alcindor to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in 1971 the media just immediately began calling him Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and now you know hardly anybody Lou Alcindor who was he you know most mm. people don't, don't even know who you're talking about Ch- things change slowly it's, at newspapers yes they certainly <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they certainly do. Yeah, was the New York it's, it's Times like, like most papers then in that regard? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. absolutely. And in fact, it was probably even more so at the the tabloids. Uh, it, well, at least in New York, uh, people like Dick Young and Red Smith were very, very anti. Um, the, you know the 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 name change and the Muslim connections and all and all the rest of it and the the anti Vietnam stance. So he was as as Steve says he was a very very controversial figure. But I believe one of the first people to adopt the his 
name Muhammad Ali was actually Howard Cosell. Yes. Yeah, Cosell was his first great champion in in terms of not only his uh you know the change uh, uh change in name but also uh, the the fact that you know that he, that as Cosell who had been a lawyer uh kept pounding away uh at he due process yeah had you know had not even been had not even begun when after he refused to take the step uh he was stripped of his championship by all of the boxing commissions throughout the country hmm. you know without waiting for for due process and that was that was Cosell's point and so he was yes Cosell was absolutely his uh his greatest uh, his greatest media champion mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that era uh, no question no question he, about it mhm when he was, when I found a, uh, the other day, I found an episode of the old game show. I've got a secret from I believe it was '65, and they introduced him well, as they had on the screen. It said, Cassius, Muhammad Ali underneath it, Cassius Clay." So mm. they said both. They actually had both, and it, and then I also found one from the later years when the show went to color, and the host. I, uh, Wally Bruner, I believe, was the host. Oh, called yeah. Him, uh, <laughs> uh, mispronounced his name. And it was really embarrassing. And and Ali didn't really react. He, he kind of just let it fly and didn't, didn't mm-hmm. say anything. He was really cool. But, but Bruner said something like, uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, he said Muhammad Ali. That's what it was. And, and it was like, really? You didn't even bother to, to, to find out what his name was? You know, that was weird. Oh, but, yeah. Well, uh, I, and- I can remember uh, Johnny Addy, who was the uh, the ring announcer at Madison Square Garden and at other locations in New York for years, always oh, yeah. uh, referred to him as Muhammad Ali, <laughs> as if his That's last name was I- Ali. Ali, yeah, a Bru- I think Bruner said the same thing. And yeah. the funny thing about I've Got a Secret is Ar- Arlene Francis was on both shows, both mm-hmm. in five and later on in the seventies when he appeared again. So it was weird. It was mm-hmm. it was strange. But yeah, one one quick question here. Yeah, because Al Al, you were saying that um, that the Beatles were not um that they were really supportive of Ali or that they were made to sound like they were su- supporting Sonny Liston actually well because well, there's they yeah. there's an article that I just read in Rolling Stone right after mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali's death where there was a quote from John Lennon where he called Muhammad Ali a loudmouth and mm-hmm. that he said that he was rooting for Liston yeah i think what happened was that most people figured that you know Liston was a 7 to 1 favorite mm. going into that fight and most people figured that he was that he was going to uh, that he was going to not only would, that he was going to win, but that he was going to hurt Clay badly, mm. you know, which is why reporters were being dispatched to hospitals. Right. Um, and uh, uh, so I, you know, I don't know how much they, you know, since they weren't really sports people, you know, they probably just John probably just said they're the they were they probably just thought that. Liston would win only because he was such a heavy favorite, okay. and you know because most people just figured that he was that this was just a loudmouth kid who had mm-hmm. um, you know who didn't really have um, you know have that much talent, and as it turned out, he was bigger and faster than uh, than Liston, and uh, and you know cut him you know <laughs> cut his face to pieces. Mm. <laughs> You know, it was uh, it was it was you know it was the fight was no contest. Okay. You know all, the discussion of um, you know Muhammad Ali sort of cutting up Liston's face and you know the, the here's the sort of problem I have with the whole Muhammad Ali thing. I mean, I I recognize and admire the uh, you know the sort of iconoclast that he was and the and and his political stances and his. Basically, everything he did except for what actually made him famous and put him in the position to do and say the things that he became and become a uh, you know a great cultural figure. But basically, mm-hmm. we're talking about a guy who was really good at beating the hell out of another guy. I, I, just, I just don't get it. So 
from <laughs> you know from my point of view, I would say you know Muhammad Ali, uh, you know, great cultural figure. The thing he's most famous for for doing professionally, I'm not that crazy about. I would recommend that everybody go on to YouTube and find a copy of Bob Dylan's "Who Killed Davy Moore" a song about yes. boxing. And the um, the other thing that I would have to say is that yes, Muhammad Ali died on uh, uh, what Saturday was it Saturday? Mm -hmm. uh, Friday um, night. Friday night. But also on Friday night, Dave Swarbrick died. Dave Swarbrick was yeah. a violinist who was mm -hmm. in Fairport Convention, and you know was a, and and a lot of the British sort of antique folk kind of uh, movement and was mm -hmm. a, a really important figure in that. And to me, Dave Swarbrick's death sort of in a way means more, you know, he's on a lot of records that I really love. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, on one hand, I don't want to take anything away from Muhammad Ali, but I, I just, uh, you know, the boxing thing, I, I don't know. It, it, it seems bizarre to me that, um, we're supposed to be in a more enlightened time, you know, and and people are celebrating boxing, you know. I mean, the big the, picture that you saw well, of, of Muhammad Ali. more to Ali's, him than that. Of course. Well, I'm saying that the more to him yeah. is what I admire. But the thing is, okay. we would never even know anything about that if not for the fact that he knocked guys out real quick and efficiently and brutally. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I've seen I've seen comments like that over the weekend. People who um, Richard Porter, as a matter of fact, the fellow who does the uh, the tours in London, mm -hmm. uh, mentioned the fact that he is not at all a boxing fan, mm -hmm. and yet admired Muhammad Ali. Uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's very possible. Yeah, do, you had to admire to, him for the other both. stuff, you know, for yes. the, being a, a figure at, at a time when civil rights was an important thing, when, when in a way, self-determination, when you can change your name and the New York Times won't let you, you know. Um, yeah. All of that stuff, absolutely, you know. But like I say, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know about him if not for the other side of it, which is kind of, kind of brutal, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's... Well, a lot that, of people that's... follow follow sports whether it's that or football some people think football is a brutal sport mm -hmm. you know but for someone to put his career on the line the way that he did and mm -hmm. to take a stance the way he did mm -hmm. it, it made it possible for other people to do the same thing absolutely i yeah. mean think about the beatles brian didn't want the beatles to talk about the vietnam war mm -hmm. you know and for them to just say they're against it and not say anything else that was that was a shock i'm sure at the time right Sure. It, it was, but do you think – I think they would have done it even if not for Muhammad Ali taking a stance there. I'm not sure they were that cognizant of um, – Yeah, I mean they're, they're really kind of exclusive of each other. Yeah, uh, because in fact, when when they did make their uh, their anti-war comments in in '66, uh, the uh, when they did make the comments in in '66, this was really uh, before Ali had really taken the the extreme anti uh, anti-war stand and and had said that he would not. You know, take the take the step to for induction into the army. Mm -hmm. You know, which was really this was which was really more later '66 and then in April of '67. Um, so really, I think the two are kind of exclusive of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, but certainly uh, they were they were in that in that fashion they were both they were both trailblazers. You know, and and, and, and and paid and 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 paid and pray, paid a price for it in both in both cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting how the you know the the they both started out kind of, you know, I don't know how to say this. Well, I mean, uh, you know, people generally thought of Ali as a well, people did think of Ali as a boxer in the beginning, and later on he became a, um, you know, a, a symbol of of. Uh, the 60s, you know, of the the uh, dissonance in the 60s, and so did the Beatles, because, you know, the Beatles later on, uh, you know, protested things in their own way, and, you know, and Lennon did, uh, McCartney did, I mean, they, sure. they, they grew in significance in, in later years. 
Well, that's kind of why I was saying that, like those in those photos from February of '64, you've got, you know, arguably the five most important pop culture figures of their time. Mm -hmm. There's video well, too, know, by the way. Yeah. What's that? There's yeah. video too, by the way, of that meeting. Oh yeah, yeah. that's oh sure. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, uh, there was one picture that I saw where you can clearly see in the background Ed Rudy. Hmm. Hmm. You know, who, wow. was, who, who was covering, you know, all of that for uh, Radio Pulse Beat News, whatever that was, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, he sent me a note, actually, I think the other day uh, about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, good old Ed. Hello, Ed. <laughs> Hello, Ed, if you're listening. <laughs> Let me add one more thing about Dave Swarbrick. Please. Um, he... It had been reported in 1999 that he had died, and uh, the Telegraph in London, I believe, wrote an obit. And in recent years, he actually sold copies of the obit at the merch tables at his concerts and said, this is the only place where you can get an autograph copy of an obit. <laughs> no, key autograph. <laughs> the, 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 the obit, the actual obit uh, for him in, in the in – Alan's old uh, old stomping grounds mentioned uh, that he was in Fairport Convention at a time when there was a good deal of uh, of upheaval as far as the lineups. Now, mm -hmm. was he in the same lineup of the group that Richard well, Sandy Thompson. Denny? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, Richard Tom right. Yeah. And how about Sandy Denny? Yeah, um, he. You know, the album Legion Leaf. Um, that was mm -hmm. sort of one of the 1969, really one of their big yeah. early records. He was mm -hmm. he was a big force in that, and uh, yeah, he's he he came and went, was in other groups, did uh, a lot of other other things too. But um, yeah, he was you know he was a big part of that sound. I mean, the idea of uh, having a, a violin in a you know, doesn't sound out of place in a folk group after all, but a folk rock group, not necessarily, you know. So, yeah. Um, Although, yeah. I guess around that same time, Rick Gretsch was in uh, uh, Family, mm -hmm. right? Before yeah. before Blind Faith. Yeah. I think when, when Thompson left Fairport, um, Swarbrick, Swarbrick um, sort of took on a bit more of the leadership of the group, but it was, as you say, it was it was – constantly evolving and uh i love that stuff you know the, the fairports uh steely steel ice band um that kind of thing and uh and so he was you know he was sort of an important figure mm -hmm. obviously didn't mm -hmm. you know Did you ever... didn't refuse to be drafted because he was british but <laughs> yeah <laughs> Did you ever? Do you ever? Uh, I, I think I mentioned the Eleanor Rigby experience a couple of weeks ago. Alan, did you ever hear them? No. Because uh, that they had a they played Beatle covers with a Steel Eye Span kind of air to them. Really, and they mm. were really amazing. Yeah, they were really amazing. Uh, really, mm. really amazing. Another band. But you mentioned Family. I loved Family. I absolutely. Roger Chapman, I think, is one mm -hmm. of the greater vocals, British vocalists, and he never really got as much credit over here as he should have. Um, they made some wonderful albums. They really did. Mm -hmm. I love, I love family. Mm -hmm. So I got to see them one time. They opened for Elton John and we were, we were in the orchestra pit. So we were like rows away and we, and, and Roger was flailing away. What he usually did. And it was, it was amazing, an amazing show. But go ahead. I'm that sorry. must've been, that must've been, been very on. early. That must've been very early in Elton's career. It was it was not really early. I mean, because Elton was headlining the show. Well, so it was yeah. with, it was with Davy John, Davy Johnston and. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so that was that would have been then early seventies then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. hmm. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and uh, of, uh, we covered a lot of uh, a lot of very uh, varied ground <laughs> in this episode. That we did. That we did, absolutely. Mm. And um, if you'd like to cover even more varied ground with us uh, by contacting <laughs> us, how do we do that, Steve? Um, you can write to us at uh, Things We Said Fab on Twitter, the at sign Things We Said Fab, 
or we have two pages on uh, Facebook. Uh, we have a radio station page uh, through Fab Four Radio, and there's also a group page called Things We Said Today, where we can talk about the shows, and you can you can have at us there, and we will we will answer you. So we, we'd love to hear from you. And I'm constantly getting um, getting prompts on my phone that this person or that person has um, asked to join the Things We Said Today page on uh, on Facebook. Yeah, we're getting really popular. We're getting a lot of followers on Podbean too. By yeah. The way. So uh, we are getting we we are coming together as the as the phrase could you could say. Mm-hmm. So there. And Ken, I think you probably have some uh, some prizes and other surprises coming up for uh, on your uh, on your web page and on every little thing. Well, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, there is Beatles trivia every single week. Mm-hmm. So that's something you can expect anytime. And there's uh, a Beatle game or a trivia question that's posted every Monday. And fans have a full week through Sunday to answer. And I have a choice of nine prizes, one of nine prizes, every single week to pick from, whether they're books or CDs or DVDs. And uh, to give you an example, Billy J. Kramer's new autobiography, Do You Want to Know a Secret? I still have copies of the Beatles 1 Plus to give away with the DVDs for their songs, for their hits. Uh, Paul McCartney's Tug of War and Pipes of Peace, the uh, special editions for those. So that's every single week, and there's lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles, including the very same people that you listen to on this show. You can hear interviews that I've done with them. So that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com, and that's all the time, not just a specific week. You can always uh, catch the trivia, special contest too, and interviews right there. Absolutely. And you can contact me uh, through uh, www.beetlefan.com or www dot paradingpress dot com for the uh, aforementioned plugged uh, change in times 101 days the shape the generation uh, or if you want to contact me through Facebook it's uh, at Al Sussman or on Twitter at at a s u s s four nine and Alan how do people uh, besides seeing your reviews and all various publications how do they uh, get in touch. Um, probably on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. I, I imagine I have some boxing debates coming up. Um, and, Could be. Yeah. Uh, and, and people actually um, have been writing a lot to the things we said today, radio show at gmail.com, and I read those and respond to them. And um, so any of those ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We all respond. Let me, let me, yeah, we do. Let me say one thing really quick. I'm Please. just now posting. As I'm as I'm sitting here typing, just now posting um, the Access.com exclusive interview with Ringo, where he answers uh, uh, questions that were submitted by by uh, people, including myself. He actually answered one of my questions, so um, it's out there now. Uh, I'm just uh, it, it'll uh, I'll, I'll put it post links uh, in a few more places, but uh, it's just getting out there as I as I as I'm talking to you this very minute. So, any hints on what your question was? It was about his album. Uh, about uh, his album. Which, Which album? album? The uh, the next album. Oh, the next. Ah, yes, the the right, the promised uh, album in 2017. Hmm. Aha. Yeah. Uh, All right. I see. Okay. Well, uh, we will look forward to seeing that. And as I said, this was a fascinating discussion. Where, uh, as I said, covered a lot of uh, a lot of ground. And so, uh, uh, this is Al Sussman, and for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, we want to thank you for listening, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>